Amen. Thank you. It's uh, it's wonderful to be back with you. As m most of you know, my wife and I were away for uh, a few days, and uh, we were glad to go, but we're glad to be back. And uh, what a privilege it is to have been able to preach while we were out there, and then to be back here. I'm going to ask you to take your Bible, if you will, and turn to the book of James. James, if you find Hebrews about the middle of the New Testament or so, uh, this right book after that is James. James chapter 4 this morning. James chapter 4. And begin with, I want us to read the first four verses. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. James 4, verses 1 to 4. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war. Ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of God, uh, I'm sorry, friend of the world, is the enemy of God. Now I call your attention to the very first phrase of verse 1. From whence, from where, come wars and fightings among you? I want to talk to you this morning on the subject, what causes war? What causes war? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we can come to you as our Heavenly Father. It's my prayer that you'll meet with us here in this building this morning. Be with those meeting in the other building. Be with those listening electronically. And again, Lord, with those unable to come today, unable to hear, unable to participate in any way, Lord, let them know your presence with them as well. Father, I pray if there's a soul listening, either in person, online, or later by recording who hears this message today who doesn't know you as savior doesn't know that when they close their eyes for the final time and breathe their last breath that they're going to step into the presence of their heavenly father if such a person is listening today or will be my prayer that they would open their heart put their faith in the lord jesus christ and be saved for those of us here who have already done that who know that we are saved. Lord, it's my prayer that you would help us just to be able to be touched by your Holy Spirit and take an honest look at ourselves and see ourselves as you see us. And Lord, speak to us, we pray, and give us ears to hear and hearts to receive what the Spirit will say to us, the church in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. In verse 1, it says, from whence come wars. The Greek word translated war, wars in that verse is polemos. And it's quite accurately translated in our English Bible as war or wars. Now, Merriam-Webster defines that English word as a state of usually open and declared conflict between states or nations. Let me read that to you again. A state of usually open open uh, open and declared conflict between states or nations now you know what in our country uh, our country is set up such that if there is a war it has to be declared now we've had uh, certain things that happened that sure looked a lot like war but it wasn't declared to be a war but there are there are systems in place and legalities that have to be followed in order for our country to declare a war. Now, not everybody does it that way. There are other countries in the world who would do it in a similar fashion, but there are other countries in the world that don't. Just the leader of the country says, we're gonna have a war and they have it. But I'm not wanting to talk to you about politics this morning. I'm not wanting to talk to you about who declares war and who doesn't. I wanna to talk to you about what causes war. The truth of the matter is war has been an almost constant condition since the days of Genesis. There's war in Genesis. Yeah, if you read it through, you'll find it. Yeah. Uh, I remember the one story in particular 
where there was an attack and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and some others were taken captured uh, were captured and some of Abraham's servants and Abraham took with him 318 men just 318 men and went after the captors and rescued all of those kings Afterward, the king of Sodom offered Abraham a great reward. And Abraham, in essence, this is not verbatim quote, but Abraham, in essence, said, I will not have it said that the king of Sodom made Abraham rich. He rescued those men, but he took nothing in return. Why? He wasn't doing it for a reward. But it appears that this condition that has been since the days of Genesis will remain until the day of the coming of the Prince of Peace. I want you to listen carefully. Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 and 7. Don't, don't take time to turn there. Just listen. Jesus said, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and earthquakes in diverse places. You know what the Lord's saying? There's going to be a war until He comes. That's not comforting. It's not the way most of us would have it. Most of us say, well, we want to have a time of, of world peace. I'm going to tell you there will never be world peace until the Lord comes. There will be conflict until that time. So I researched to try to find out how many wars are going on in the world presently right now. And my research wasn't as satisfying as I'd hoped it'd be because I found, uh, depending on the source of information, the precise definition of what qualifies as war, there were anywhere from 15 to 45 wars occurring on different points of the globe right now. Well, so you say 15 to 45, that's quite a distance. Yeah, again, it depends on what you, how you define a war and, and who's giving you the information. But what causes war? That's our subject this morning. One article I read gave eight primary reasons for war. Now, this is not my list. This is somebody else's list. I'm going to give you something. These are symptoms of what causes war, but I'm going to get down to the root cause. You know, if, if you have an illness and you go to the doctor and they just treat the symptoms, you're likely to feel better, but you may not be truly well. you got to get down to the root of the problem, what's causing you to be sick in the first place. So here they are. Eight, list of eight points. I'm going to go in reverse order, starting with number eight. So number one is, is the most prominent reason. Okay, are you ready? Number eight, defensive or preemptive action. A nation has been attacked or is threatened to the point that they believe attack is imminent. Well, I, th I think countries have a right to defend themselves. You know, at least two major countries in the war do not have a military in the sense that we think of a military. Now, I have to say it in the sense that we think of a military because they do have people in uniform who carry weapons and that kind of thing. And I don't want you to think that they don't. But those two countries are Japan and Israel. Japan and Israel, you don't join the military per se, uh, but you serve in the defense force. The Israeli military is called the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force. Why? Because that's what it's for, to defend people. Japan, after World War II, signed a treaty that they would not have a standing military. But they do have a defense force. Now, I think it's reasonable that any country ought to be able to have a defense force. Does that make sense to you? They ought to be able to protect themselves. Absolutely. So number eight, defensive or preemptive action. Number seven, revolution an act to overthrow the current government and its leadership. Number six, civil war. War between varying parties within the same country. Uh, there, there is a mindset, and it's not new, it's been around for a very long time, that if we could have just one world government, if one government could, could govern the whole world, we'd have world peace. There's a word for that, it's called nonsense. 
If that were true, then there'd never be a civil war, would they? But there are civil wars, and there wouldn't be revolutions, would they? But there are revolutions and civil wars. Number five, revenge. You did something to, bad to our country, or your ancestor did something maybe 5,000 years ago, but we must fight. Yasser Arafat, anybody remember that name? Yasser Arafat was the leader of the Palestine Liberation Organization. I heard him speak on several occasions, not in person, on, on television, but I heard him speak on several occasions. And on more than once, I heard him say this. Now these, these are things that he said. I'm just quoting him. These are his words. He said, we will kill the Jews on Saturday and the Christians on Sunday. But that's not all he said. And this one may surprise you, but I'm going to tell you, as surprising as this may sound, this is the mindset of many people. He's not the only person in the world by far who thinks this way. Well, he may have changed his mind since he passed away, but, but the fact of the matter is he did think this way. He said one of his motivations for wanting to conquer and destroy Israel, are you ready for this? Was to avenge Goliath. Folks, that was thousands of years ago. And you're going to get revenge? At, there are people who think that way. They really do. Don't, don't think. No, nobody thinks like that. We don't think that way. At least I hope we don't. We ought not to think that way. I'm going to tell you, I don't see a person from Britain and think that dirty red coat. I, I don't look at them like that. I don't. They're not my enemy. When I was in Japan and I met a man in a church who was in his 80s and obviously had been there in World War II, I didn't look at him as an enemy. I saw him as my Christian brother. The truth of the matter is, when I see somebody from Ohio, I don't think that stinking Yankee. I don't think that way, folks. I don't. I don't see it like that. And nobody else should either. Gracious, something that happened hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago and you're still sore about it? There's something not right there. Something there that just doesn't make sense. You know what that's like? Let me give you an illustration of what that's like. I'll go on with the list here in a minute. Here's an illustration of what that's like. Suppose I went in the neighborhood across the street over there and I bought a house. I'm not likely to do that, but just, let's just pretend. I'll go across the street in the neighborhood and buy a house. And I'm happy in the house and I meet a neighbor and that neighbor and I get along well and we're friends until that neighbor finds out that somebody who lived in that house before murdered his uncle. So now that neighbor hates me. Why? I had nothing to do with it. Well, you're living in that house. Yeah, but I still had nothing to do with it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. That's the same idea as holding a grudge for hundreds and thousands of years. And holding a grudge against people who had nothing to do with whatever it is you're holding a grudge about. They weren't there. They didn't do it. Well, their ancestors do it. How do you know that? How do you know that? Do you know who their ancestors are? Yeah, they belong to this group or that group. How do you know their ancestry, I'm asking you? And even if, even if you could find out their ancestors had something to do with that, does that make you guilty of it? It doesn't. It doesn't, folks. Let's suppose, we would, while we're pretending, that it wasn't the previous owner of that house who murdered this neighbor's uncle. Suppose it was my ancestor who murdered that neighbor's uncle. Now, are you going to blame me for that? I wasn't even born when that happened. It had nothing to do with it. Do you see what I'm saying? Revenge never turns out well. There's an old saying and I'm hard pressed to tell you where it originates because I've heard it as a Chinese proverb I've heard it as a Native American proverb I've heard it comes from several different sources so who said it first I don't know but still makes sense it goes like this the man who seeks revenge must first dig two graves and the fact of the matter is you're going to hurt yourself well what are we supposed to do about it I'll tell you what you do about it God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. 
You let him take care of it. Getting your revenge. Are you saying crime shouldn't be pun punished? I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying punishment of crime should not be done in a spirit of revenge. Should be done in a spirit of justice. There's a big difference between justice and revenge. Number four on the list, nationalism. Our way of life, our culture is superior to that of others, so it must be forced upon them. Now look, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be national pride. I think there should be national pride. I think persons of all countries ought to be happy about their heritage. At least, the very least, be accepting of your heritage. But in most cases, if not all, be happy about your heritage. Well, what if I got some of those ancestors did bad things? You know what? That's, that may be. That may be. You know what you can do? You can be the better person. You can be the person who doesn't do what your ancestors did. Number three on the list, religion. Now, on this person's list, this is, again, I want to emphasize, this is not my list. Because I've heard it said, maybe, all wars are fought over religion. Well, according to this list, that's number three. Not number one. And certainly not all eight. Well, all the rest of them come under religion. They do not. That is not true. Number two. Uh, let me, before I move number two, are there ever wars fought? over religion yes but that's not the main reason wars are fought number two reason territorial gain you got land and I want it I'm gonna take it from you well you can't take it I'll fight you okay we got a war how as often as that happened all the time does that happen today count on it I could name some specific incidents going on right now that that's what's going on Somebody's got land, somebody else wants it. Number one. Number one purpose for war. Economic gain. Somebody else has a resource and you want it and you're going to take it. And they don't want to give it up, so you're going to fight over it. Okay? That's the main reason wars are fought. So that one government or one country can enrich themselves at another's expense. Now again, this is not my list. I'm going to give you another list. Before I do, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to quote, give you six quotations. Now I'm going to tell you who they are. These are six men whose names I think you'll recognize all of them. You may not like all of these men. You don't have to. I'm not saying you have to like all of these men. I don't know for sure, but there's a good possibility if they were to meet in one room, which would, could only happen in eternity, but if they did, they might not like each other. But they have certain things in common. Number one, they're all Americans. Number two, they're all veterans of war. And except for one of them, they are veterans of multiple wars. Okay. And number three, they all have a similar view about war. Listen to what they have to say. First one's in your bulletin this morning. The soldier, above all, always prays for peace. For it is the soldier who must suffer and bear the scars of war. General Douglas MacArthur. General MacArthur, if, if you're not aware of it, was the head of the Pacific Command in World War II. That means he not only commanded the U.S. troops, but all the Allied troops in the Pacific Theater. Second quote, War may sometimes be a necessary evil, but no matter how necessary, it is always evil, never a good. We will not learn how to live together in peace by killing each other's children. Navy veteran and former President James Earl Carter. Quote number three. What a cruel thing war is to separate and destroy families and friends and mar the purest joys and happiness God has granted us in this world. General Robert E. Lee. Quote number four. I hate war 
as only a soldier who has lived it can, only as one who has seen its brutality, its futility, its stupidity. Former President and Supreme Allied Commander in World War II, Dwight David Eisenhower. The last two quotes are by a man who was, again, both a general and a president. Number five, to be prepared for war is one of the most effective means of preserving peace. Let me run that one by you again. To be prepared for war is one of the most effective means of preserving peace. Let me give you an illustration of that. Uh, there's a man who was named James Matose. Most of you wouldn't know that. Matose is a Japanese man, and I'm sure he was of Japanese descent, but he lived in Hawaii. Uh, as far as I know, his entire life, he lived in Hawaii. James Matosi created a system of self-defense, and his system of self-defense is very involved and very effective. And he taught multitudes of people, and then his students taught people and, and goes on to this day. And then think about this. James Matosi taught this whole system of self-defense, and then he told his students this. Think about it. If you ever have to use what I've taught you, you have failed. How can he say that? I'll tell you how he said it. What is he saying? He's saying, prepare yourself and be ready if you have to. But work so that you don't have to. Now, is he saying, never defend yourself? No, that would be kind of insane, wouldn't it? What he's saying is, work so you don't have to defend yourself. But, going back to this other question, or, or other quote I meant, to be prepared for war is one of the most effective means of preserving peace. Former President and General George Washington. Another quote by George Washington. He said, my first wish is to see this plague of mankind, war, banished from the earth. Well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate all those quotes. And I certainly appreciate General Washington, President Washington. But the truth of the matter is, it's not banished from the earth, is it? And Jesus said it's not going to be until he comes. I, I don't say that to discourage you. I say that to lay a foundation for what we're going to see here in James. So I want you to take a look at it. James chapter 4, verse 1. James says, From whence? come wars and fightings among you. Where does war come from? And he answers the question in verse 1, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence? Is this not where they come? Don't they come from here? Where is here? Even of your lusts that war in your members. The war that's in you, the war that's fighting inside you is where war comes from. And what war is that? The war of lust. That fights in your own members. Remember that list I shared with you of, of eight reasons somebody else said cause war? Well, the top two are territorial gain and economic gain. That's precisely what James is saying here. He says the wars come from the lust inside of us. The word lust here means the desire to please yourself. Now let me use a different word, means the same thing. The word is selfishness. Selfishness. And folks, I've not lived as long as some people, and I don't know how long I'm going to live, but here's what I know. In my lifetime, our society in general is more selfish than it's ever been. Everybody wants what they want from me. Forget about you, just as long as I get what I want. And it may cost you, it may hurt you, but it doesn't matter as long as I get what I want. I want what I want, whether I deserve it or not. I want what I want, whether I've earned it or not. I want what I want, whether I can pay for it or not. I just want it. That's selfishness. Selfishness or self-centeredness is the root of all evil. Now we're getting down to the root cause. What causes war? Selfishness. It's the root of all evil. Paul wrote this, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows, 1 Timothy 6.10. 
Many times people quote the Bible and they misquote the Bible. This is one of those times. People often say, well, money is the root of all evil. The Bible never says that money is the root of all evil. It does not say that. And that's not true. Money is not the root of all evil. Money is, in our world society, is necessary for survival. And it's necessary for many things. And the Bible gives us a great deal of information, particularly in the book of Proverbs, but other places as well, on how to rightfully handle money. Be good to study that out. Others have say, well, I wish somebody would prepare a study for me. I just, well, lots of people have done that. I could name a few for you. But the truth is, you're going to have to get down to God's perspective on the thing, and you're going to get God's perspective on it, then you're going to start to make better decisions. And it starts with not being selfish. It is not money that is the root of all evil. It is selfish desire that is the root of all evil. It is the selfishness of mankind's heart that causes wars and fightings. And that's what James says here in verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members? Verse 2. You lust and have not. You desire, your selfish desires eat you alive, but you don't ever have them fulfilled. You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have. I remember many years ago, I was watching the television news one evening. And there was a young man, I, I think he was 16 if I remember right, very young man. He had murdered a couple and stolen their car. He had gotten caught, got arrested, and though he was under 18, sentenced as an adult to life imprisonment. After his trial, they were taking him out, and a news reporter came up with a microphone, stuck the microphone in his face and said, why did you do what you did? I'll never get his answer. Listen to it. He said, I just had to get a car. Do you hear that? He murdered two people to get their car. Now I'd love to tell you that's an isolated incident. It's not. That kind of thing has happened many times. There was a young man I knew years ago, very sharp young man, very handsome young man, very sharp, very intelligent, very nice personality, uh, just a great young man. He grew up right here, attended our camp years ago. He went off to college. I didn't see him or hear anything about him for a long time. One day I ran into his father and I asked how he was doing. His father had a smile, but the smile went away and he said, oh, he, he's passed. I said, oh, I hadn't heard. I said, what happened? He told me that this young man was, had gone to university in another state. And then one evening he was out and somebody wanted his jacket and he refused to give it up and they killed him for it. For a jacket. This sharp, handsome, intelligent young man was killed for a jacket. That speaks of the selfishness of mankind's heart. That speaks of where evil comes from. It comes from the heart. When we come to love our neighbors ourselves, then and only then will we begin to have peace with our neighbor. This means, as Paul wrote, listen, this is Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. And that doesn't mean to look on them to want them. It means look after other people's interests. Well, if I do that, who's going to take care of me? Well, let's think that through. If everybody did that, and you're taking care of other people, who'd take care of you? Other people, wouldn't they? Well, it doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't, does it? Why not? Because we're selfish. Well, I've gone out and I've helped other people and I've served them and they did nothing in return. I, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. But you trust God and you do what's right. I talked to somebody the other day. I said, how are you doing? They said, I'm just trying to do right. I said, well, you keep on doing that. Just keep on trying to do right. Look at verse 2. 
Again, you lust and have not. You desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war. You have not because you ask not. A lot of the things you want, God would give you if you would ask. Say, so, well, I prayed for something, didn't get it. Next verse, we'll get there in a minute. But the truth of the matter is, a lot of things we don't have because we didn't ask. Now, I read a story years ago, and it's just a story. I'm not telling you this is how it really is, but it makes a good illustration. The story is of a man who died and went to heaven, and since he's a new arrival there, he was being given a tour of heaven, and they walked by a certain room, and the room was full of treasures. Just absolutely filled with treasures. And the man said, the one giving him the guided tour, said, what is that? He said, that's where we keep all the things that God had for people they never asked him for. Now, is there really a room like that? Probably not. I don't know. But you get the point of the story, don't you? The point of the story is what James says here in the end of verse 2. You have not because you ask not. Solomon was the only king of Israel. He wasn't the first king of Israel. He was the third king of Israel, and there were many after him. But he was the first king of Israel and only king of Israel who had no battles during his reign. Isn't that interesting that his name means peace? Well, that's not just interesting. That's God's design. David wanted to build a house for the Lord, but David was told by the Lord, no, you're a, you're a man with blood on his hands. You can't build my house. Solomon comes along. He's a man of peace. He builds a house for the Lord. But Solomon wrote these words. And he's not talking here about peace. He's talking about selfishness. Listen to what Solomon said. There is a generation that curses their father and doth not bless their mother. Anything wrong with that? Yeah, God says, honor your father and your mother. If you knew my old man, you wouldn't say that. Yeah, I'd still say it. I would. Why? Because God said it. There is a generation that curses their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes. Do you know anybody like that? They are right in their own eyes. There's an old saying about people being a legend in their own time. And then there's a, another version of that says they're a legend in their own mind. Uh, some people just believe that they're always right. They can't be wrong. And I'd love to tell you that's just folks in the world that there's nobody I've ever met in a church like that. But that if I told you that, I'd be lying. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes. And yet, in their own eyes, they're right. They're righteous. And yet is not washed from their filthiness. You know what that means? They've never been forgiven. You know why they've never been forgiven? Because they've never seen themselves as wrong. You can't get forgiven if you're not wrong. You will never get God's forgiveness if you don't understand that you have something that you need to be forgiven for. For which you need to be forgiven, more grammatically correct. There is a generation pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed in their filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from the earth and the needy from among men. The horse leech hath two daughters crying, Give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied, yea, four that say it is not enough. Four things never have enough. The grave. Death is never full. The grave. Number two, the barren womb. The child, the womb that cannot bear children. Number three, the earth that is not filled with water. And fire that saith not, it is enough. That's Proverbs 30, verses 11 to 16. I want you to look with me for a minute back in chapter 1 of James. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Because this is, again, we're talking about root causes here. Getting down to the, literally the heart of the matter. James 1, 14 and 15. But every man is tempted. Now, we know that. 
We know everybody's tempted. Everybody has temptations. We've talked about that before. You have temptations. I have temptations. Yours may not be mine. Mine may not be yours. What tempts me may not tempt you at all. And you might say, well, I don't even see how that could bother you. What tempts you may not bother me at all. But we all have temptations. But watch what James says here. James 1, 14, 15. But every man is tempted when... Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When are we tempted? When we give in to our own lust. When we give in to our own selfish desires. That's when we're tempted. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Verse 15. Then when lust hath conceived. Lust brings forth children. When lust hath conceived it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You know, I've said this here many times. I'm going to say it again. If you could live your entire life from birth to death, and, and, and you would never have death if you'd never sinned. If you could live your whole life and never sin, you'd never die. But everybody dies sooner or later. Some sooner, some later, but everybody dies sooner or later. And we think we die because we get old, we get sick, or we have an accident. Well, those are the symptoms that, that bring it on. But the root cause is sin. Romans says, Paul writes in Romans, he says, the wages of sin is death. That's saying because we sin, we have to die. But that's only the part of the verse. The rest of the verse says, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I was watching a TV show years ago, made in the 50s, and it was one of my favorite television shows of all time. And in this particular episode, there was a, a young couple, and the, the wife was expecting, and there was two men who were doing very evil to this young couple. And the hero of the story comes in and, and rescues the young couple. But at the end of the episode of this show, follow me on this, at the end of the episode of the show, one of the two men who were doing evil this, con uh, this couple died, got killed. And about the time that fella got killed, the lady delivered the baby. And one of the main characters on the show looked at that situation and said, pointing towards the fellow who died said the wages of sin is death but the gift of God and they didn't say eternal but they did say his life that was network TV yeah that was network TV it's changed quite a bit hasn't it yeah. why has it changed I'll tell you why it's changed because of people have given into their lust hear me on this 1968 the television series was Dragnet, 1968. That was the first television show to ever use profanity on network television. Prior to 1968, nobody did it. But about, no what about, nobody did it. Why? It was against the law. Fast forward, I think this was the 80s. I, I don't remember, I never watched this show. Maybe you did, I don't know if you did. Don't, don't say, oh, Pastor, I'm sorry, there's no reason to say that. I never watched it. There was a show called NYPD Blue. I don't know if you remember it or not. Again, I never saw one episode of it. But that was the first network television show to have nudity in it. Really? Yeah. I'm not talking about HBO or something like that. I'm talking about network television. I forget. Is NBC, ABC, one of them, CBS, one of those networks. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'll take that as expert opinion. All right. Now, the truth of the matter is, why didn't we have those things before? Because our society wouldn't abide it before. But people give in to their own lusts. And that's what it's saying here. Verse 15, James 1, 15. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Let's go back to chapter 4. Chapter 4. In verse 2, you lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, you fight and more, you have not because you ask not. But preacher, I asked and I didn't receive. Verse 3, you ask and receive not. Has that ever happened to you? It probably has. 
it's been often said, and by the way, this is not a Bible verse, but it's often said that, that God has three answers to prayer. Yes, no, and wait a while. Now, it's not quite that simplistic, but there is truth in that. Again, that's not a Bible verse. That's, that's somebody speaking from experience. But James tells us something here. He says, you ask and receive not. Now, before we go one word farther, let me tell you this. There can be more than one reason why you ask something in prayer and you don't receive it. Let me give you a couple of examples. In the Old Testament it says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear, you, hear me. Now, I'm going to give you another reference, Old Testament reference on that in a moment. Or maybe that's tonight. We're doing a follow-up message tonight. To ask and receive not. Jesus said, And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. All right? You ask, but you don't believe. Don't expect to receive. Well, I'm going to pray for God to do this. But I don't really think He's going to do it. Well, then you're probably right. Okay? Does that make sense to you? All things the prayer promises that you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Well, what about I, I prayed real hard for some, didn't come. Well, look at this. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. Now, there's a marginal note in my Bible. It may not be in your Bible on that word amiss, depending on which edition of the Bible you have. But if I go to that marginal note for that word amiss, it says evilly. You ask evilly. Now, there's something to that, but what it's saying is this. You ask amiss, you ask for the wrong thing. You ask for the wrong thing. I used to be a coach many years ago and um, coached high school sports. And I did some things with our team that um, probably a lot of coaches wouldn't have done. And maybe those coaches won more games, so I'm not going to criticize them. But here's what I am going to say. I taught our team, the boys on our team, to pray before a game. I didn't ask them, get them to ask God to help them win. I got them to ask God to help them do their best. Because the truth is, if you've given it your best, you can't give it anymore if you truly gave it your best. Whether you won or lost, the point is you did your best. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. put it this way. He said, it's not a sin to fail. It's a sin to do less than your best to keep from failing. And that's right. You can do your best and still lose. I could give you illustrations of that. For sake of time, I won't. But you still need to give it your best. There's a basketball quote. I don't know where it comes from, but maybe some of you would. But it, it makes sense. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. <laughs> you know? and, and that's a fact. You've got to give it your best. So you ask and receive not because you ask amiss. You ask for the wrong thing. I hate that guy. God, I wish you'd kill that guy. Really? Do you think God wants to answer that prayer? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. That guy's got a beautiful new car. I got an old heap that barely runs. I wish something happened to him and I'd get his car. Really? Really? Oh, let's try this one. I wish I'd win that Powerball. Man, you know, I could use those millions of dollars they're giving away. There's so much I could say about that. I met a man years ago. I've told some of you this before. I met a man years ago who had a beautiful car. It was, it was a brand of car that I'm not particularly fond of, but this one was beautiful. And I asked him where he got it. Here was his answer. He said, I won the lottery. I said, really? He said, twice. Wow, twice wasn't too long after that. I don't know, maybe a year or two. I was talking to that same man. You know what he had? Nothing. He had lost everything he had. The car was gone. The money was gone. His house was gone. His family was gone. He had nothing. But he won the lottery twice. 
Is that really the route you want to take? Well, it doesn't happen that way to everybody. No, I'm sure it doesn't. But I've heard too many stories like that. Too many. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. Why? What is asking amiss? Here's the key to it. That you may consume it upon your lusts. That you may consume it upon your lust. Hmm. Isn't that what he's talking about in the other two verses? It sure is. So you're still back to the root cause of war in that you pray and you pray to satisfy your own lust. Jesus put it this way, Matthew 5, 15, 19, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. And because the lust of the heart can't be filled, James says, you lust and desire to have and cannot obtain, you fight and war, you, and that is what causes war. You have not because you ask not. You fight and scheme even to kill, to get what you want, which will never be enough. But you won't turn to God. And you won't turn to God and ask Him for what you need. Some prayers are not answered because they're selfish prayers. Look at verse 4. You adulterers and adulteresses. Now, just very clearly in the Bible... Adultery is sexual sin for the married person. It's, it's that clear and simple. The adulterers and adulteresses know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Now, if, if you're reading that and you're thinking purely physically, you're missing the point. This is talking about spiritual adultery. What is spiritual adultery? In the Old Testament, and I say in the Old Testament because it's not just limited to one book. God talks to the people of Israel about committing spiritual adultery because in the Old Testament, Israel is pictured as the wife of Jehovah. In the New Testament, the church is pictured as the bride of Christ. In either case, for the people of Israel or for the church to turn away from God and to turn to other gods, to turn to idols, to pray to Brahma or any other idol, is spiritual adultery. And why do people do that? Well, here it is. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now don't misunderstand what James just told you. He didn't say, don't care about anybody else in the world. If he did, that would be contrary to what else he says in this book and the rest of the Bible says. What he's saying is, don't fall in love with this world system. Don't fall in love and come to life with a selfish heart. Adultery comes from a selfish heart. Never from love, no matter how often it gets blamed on that. What do you mean by that? Oh, I, I, yeah, I, I committed adultery, but I loved him or I loved her. Well, maybe, but that's not why you committed adultery committed adultery because you wanted to. Adultery comes from a selfish heart, never from love, no matter how often it's blamed on that. Friendship with the world then means friendship with the lust of this world and ignoring the will of God. Notice James says here, whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. You want to be an enemy of God? I don't. I don't want to be God's enemy. And the truth of the matter is, you want to know about being an enemy of God, read Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 tell you all about it. Tell you about being an enemy of God, tell you what to do if you find yourself to be an enemy of God. It's all there. Romans chapter 5. Spend some time in it. But the friend of the world, it clearly says the enemy of God. Again, that doesn't mean hating the people of this world. It means hating the evil of this world. It means hating the selfishness of this world. Then verse 5. James says, Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Now, James here is referring, when he says the Scripture, and I was going to say more about this tonight, and I probably will still, but James 
good chance was the first book of the New Testament ever written. Most likely was. You mean before Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? Yeah, long before that. Probably the first book of the New Testament written. So when James says, do you think the scripture, what does he mean? He means the Old Testament, doesn't he? You'd have to. So do you think the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? I think James may have been referring to Genesis 6, 5 and 6, where it says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and, listen, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. You know what happened right after that? God sent the flood. Oh, you don't believe there's a worldwide flood. Let, let, let me run something by you. I just thought that we were out west uh, last few days, you know that, and I've seen this before, but I couldn't help but notice the mountains all there all show signs of water erosion. What does that mean? That means once upon a time those mountains had water over them. Ah, it's not just my inexpert opinion. That is the opinion of geologists. They'll admit that. They'll tell you that all of the southwestern U.S., what is now the U.S., was one time underwater. They'll tell you there's no worldwide flood. But think about that. Well, you've got to depend on science. All right, let's, let's talk about science. Let me run another theory by you. The polar ice caps are melting, and the sea levels are going to rise and probably flood all over the world. But there couldn't have been a worldwide flood in the past. Just think that through a little bit, folks. Think it through. Do you really think the ice caps are going to melt? I don't know. The whole world's going to burn up eventually, so yeah, at least then they will. But here's what I do know. James cites this reference, and God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth and grieved him at his heart or maybe James had in mind Exodus 20 17 thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife nor his manservant nor his maidservant nor his ox nor his ass nor anything that is thy neighbor's maybe that's what James had in mind Verse 6, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. This is the key to it right here. God resists pride. Don't come into the presence of God with your pride. God gives grace to the humble. What is grace? Grace, according to Titus 3, 4, is the love and kindness of God our Savior toward man. Mankind is lost. Don't miss that. Mankind is lost. A couple of prayer requests I didn't share earlier this morning, and I should have. One of our former members, Susan Pryor, most of you here wouldn't know Susan. It's only a few of you here who were here when she was here. But she is this week, Tuesday, I think, having major cancer surgery and has asked for our prayers. And apparently it's, it's very, very serious. Then there was an evangelist that I've known for decades, Doug Martin. And Doug is uh, having cancer surgery on Tuesday. So if you could remember Susan Pryor and Doug Martin as they have these major surgeries. I thought about that because Doug Martin used to have, I haven't seen him in many years, but he used to carry a briefcase with him. And he had the words, you remember the Dynamo label maker? You guys remember those? He had this on his business cards that he'd hand out, but he had it with one of those label makers on his briefcase. Three words, men are lost. Constant reminder to himself, men are lost. I've got a couple of reminders up here on the pulpit I had put up here decades ago. They're right in front of me all the time. On this side right here, it says, pray for power. Do you do that? Yeah, sure do. On this side over here, it says, sir, we would see Jesus. What does that mean? It means it's not about the person standing here. It's about you 
looking at Jesus. That's what it means. Those are reminders for me and anybody else that stands in this pulpit. So Doug Martin had that reminder to himself, men are lost. Well, here's what God says about it, Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear you. Go back to James 4, 6. But he giveth more grace. God gives grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. So here's the key to the whole situation today. Here's the key to the root cause of war. How are we going to deal with it? Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. That's it. That's it. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Next phrase. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Well, how am I going to resist the devil? We'll talk about that more tonight. But let, let me just give you some help right now. Matthew chapter 3. Jesus, at the end of chapter 3, I should say, Jesus is baptized. Now, we could talk about that. and There's a lot to say there, but uh, I'm trying to set a stage for you. Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is baptized. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus begins his public preaching and teaching ministry. In chapter 4, the beginning of chapter 4, Jesus fasts for 40 days and 40 nights and is tempted by Satan. And yet Jesus resists the temptation every time by doing what? Quoting scripture. Psalmist writes, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. You know what we need, folks? We need to hide God's word in our heart. You talk about memorizing? I'm talking about memorizing and meditating. Now, when I say meditating, I don't mean to sit cross-legged and hold your hands like this and, and hum. I don't mean that. I mean you take it and you internalize it and you get the meaning out of it and you pray and you ask God what he's saying to you in this scripture and you make it part of you. That's what we're talking about. Hide God's word in your heart. Then use God's word and let the Holy Spirit use God's word in your heart and mind and life to help you resist temptation and help you resist the tempter. That's actually what it says, Matthew 3. Matthew 4, I'm sorry. The tempter came to him. See, temptation's always out there, but it's our lust that gives in to it. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. War comes from the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. It comes from the heart of men. Peace also has to come from the heart. The heart has to be surrendered to God. Many years ago, I remember my daughter Christy was with me for this. She was just a little girl then. She's, she's a, very much an adult now. But I was asked to be part of a panel discussion. The subject was world peace. And there was on the platform, myself and three other people, there was a Hindu priestess, there was a Muslim imam, there was a rabbi, and there was me. So they figured they had all the bases covered. Okay, they got Hindu, Islam, uh, Judaism, and Christianity. And they asked each of us questions about world peace and so forth. There was one thing, and, and pretty much only one thing that we all agreed on that you'll never have world peace until people have peace in their own heart. They all agreed on that? They all agreed on that point. There wasn't much else that we agreed on, but we agreed on that point. Did you give the gospel? Sure. Why wouldn't I? How'd you do it? It was real simple. I had given part, of, they'd asked each of us part of our life stories, and I talked about how I grew up in, in something of a rough neighborhood. It wasn't that way when my family moved there. It became that way over time. I grew up in kind of a rough neighborhood and a lot of the guys that I grew up with before they were 
21 either were in prison or dead. So the moderator of this meeting said to me, he said, well, Reverend, nobody who knows me calls me Reverend, but anyway, uh, he said, Reverend, how is it that you didn't turn out like those guys you grew up with? And I looked at the fellow and said, well, who said I didn't? I said, I wasn't better than they were. I said, he said, well, what happened? I said, I'll tell you what happened. I found Jesus Christ and trusted him as my Savior, and he changed my life. He'll change your life. What do I have to do? You have to trust him. Peace comes from the heart, comes from the heart that is surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. Years ago, there was a man who attended the church here. He was never a member, but he attended here quite a bit. If I mentioned his name, some of you might remember him. He talked to me often after services, which was fine. One evening, we stood out front there and he was talking to me. He said, well, I won't be back. I said, well, I'm sorry to hear that. What? Why not? He says, you're always asking people to surrender. And I hate that word surrender. I'm not surrendering to anybody or anything. Now, folks, I'm not here to criticize that man. I'm here to tell you surrender is the key. Surrender your heart, your mind, your life, your priorities, your desires, all of it to the Lord Jesus. Well, if I give up everything, what will I have then? Well, Peter asked that question. And the Lord, to put it succinctly, said, I'll never shortchange you. Anything you give up to me, I'll give you back more than you gave up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we've had this time together, time to look into your word. And Lord, help us right now as men and women who believe in you to realize that what we need to do is surrender our own heart and mind to others. Lord, you know it's a waste for us to wait for others to surrender and give their heart to you if we will not do so. We must begin in our own heart. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Maybe the Lord has spoken to your heart this morning. Maybe there's something that was in the scriptures, something in the message this morning that God used to speak to your heart, or maybe God's been speaking to your heart for a while. And it's not just what you heard this morning, it's the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you. And there's areas of your life that you haven't turned over to Him. I'm going to tell you this is a prime opportunity for you to do that. Right now, right where you are, surrender your heart fully to Him. Those things which you keep Him locked out from, open that door and give it to Him. I'm going to tell you, if you haven't already done so, to surrender your sins to the Lord. I'm going to tell you to surrender your soul to the Lord. I'm going to tell you to surrender your life to the Lord. If you don't know for sure that you're saved this morning, that you've been born again, that is to say that you're on your way to heaven. Right here, right now, call on the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, I believe. I believe that you love me. I believe that you died on the cross to pay for my sin. And right here, right now, I'm trusting you to forgive me, to save me, and to give me everlasting life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, maybe you prayed that prayer with me. Maybe you didn't, but you call on him and you ask him to save you. He's, he'll do it. You ask him to forgive you. He's paid for your sins. You ask him to give you life. He has risen from the dead. He will give you life. You call on him. You trust him right now. Preacher already did that. Wonderful. I'm so, so happy you have. You are his child then forever. But have you given him full control? Is it all his? Or have you kept back part for yourself? 
Another hymn we sing, I Surrender All. This one, Have Thine Own Way. We're going to stand and sing it. As we do, if God's spoken to your heart and you need to make a decision, do it now. If you want to come forward and pray, come forward and pray. Help us this morning, we ask. Lord Jesus, in your name, amen. Let's stand together. We're singing, have thine own way. And that's what I want you to do. Let the Lord have his way in your heart and mind and life.